this by about half a foot. So 2nd and 3rd John have only 27 verses between them, so this can't be long no matter what. But 2nd and 3rd John are good books. Why don't we just have a brief word of prayer before we actually get into the verses. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that this time would be instructive and encouraging. Lord, each of us faces needs and problems and stresses, and we just pray that these books will speak to us as they have to other people for almost 2,000 years now. In Jesus' name, amen. It's interesting to think about what things were like 100 years ago and how people back then needed the book of John and or the book of first, the second and third John, and we today need second and third John as well. Think back to 100 years ago, just in American history, your grandparents or parents might have talked about some of these things, mine did. 2012, Woodrow Wilson was elected to the presidency, and so he proved to be fairly popular. And so in 2016, he was elected again on the campaign slogan, he kept us out of war. Of course, World War I was raging at that time in Europe. We weren't involved yet. It was the deadliest w war the world had ever known. When it started, people thought it would be over in six or eight weeks, and it was well into its third year by then, by 100 years ago from right now. And as soon as Wilson got elected, he plunged us into the war. Historians still argue whether it was a good or a bad thing, but at the time, there were riots because people were upset that he hadn't kept his campaign promise. Then just about that same time, a little bit after that, there was the baseball scandal, Black Sox scandal that my grandfather followed very closely. That was one of the worst sports scandals of all time. People had been bought off to win and lose games at command. And then about the same time, there was the Spanish flu epidemic, the worst Spanish flu epidemic, the worst flu epidemic that's ever struck the earth. A million people died. And so I know personally what people thought about these things because my grandparents would actually tell me about them because they lived through them and they knew people that were affected by them and they were aware of all the discouragement that happened because of them. And then after Wilson was no longer president after his two terms, Harding was elected and he got involved in the big teapot dome scandal and that was even worse than what Wilson had done. And so there were challenging times and we live in challenging times. There is no time we don't need what the Bible says. So let's go to 2nd and 3rd John and read some verses to get started. So first of all, in 2nd John, let's look at verses 5 and 6. 2nd and 3rd John, right before the book of Revelation, uh, right before the book of Jude anyway. All very short books. So 2nd John, verse, verses 5 and 6. John wrote this short letter to a lady that he thought highly of. He probably wrote it when he was working in Ephesus. And then, of course, we know that John was imprisoned on the Isle of Patmos, which was a penal colony. And it's considered part of Greece today, but back in his day, almost 2,000 years ago, it was considered part of Asia Minor, which now we call Turkey. It wasn't too far from Ephesus. It wasn't too far from all these seven cities of the churches of Revelation. So he had been working in Ephesus, and then apparently he ran afoul of the Roman government in some way, and so they just sent him off to the closest penal colony, and he probably wrote this letter before that happened, though. So he writes to a lady that he thinks a lot of, the elect lady, and he says in verse 5, Now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that, as ye have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. And then let's look at 3 John, verse 11, where John says, and here he's writing to a person named Gaius, Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, and he that doeth evil hath not seen God. It's interesting when we look at the, the four books that John wrote, the, the Gospel of John, and then 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, these letters that he wrote that are placed toward the end of the New Testament. It's interesting that they have some themes that run continuously through the four of them, 
One thing John never does, one thing the New Testament never does really, is talk about how to have a Christian nation. It really personalizes the Christianity. In fact, we could really search pretty long and hard through the New Testament and never find the concept of a Christian nation. One reason is because the New Covenant was now in force and under the Old Covenant you had a chosen nation, that was Israel, but now the Gentiles had been brought into the picture with the Apostle Paul, and none of the Gentile nations were to be chosen the same way Israel was. In fact, we can go back to the Old Testament for a contrast. We have Psalm 33, verse 12. We won't turn there. I'll just read it. But Pastor Ted mentioned this verse on Sunday. Psalm 33, 12 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And so that's always a good principle. And that's a good principle for us. It's a good principle for any nation. And our nation could never follow that principle too strongly. Every nation that's ever existed has failed at that principle ultimately. But then Psalm 33, 12 goes on to say, blessed is the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance, and that's uniquely Israel. So this Psalm 33, 12 is a general principle that applies to us and any other nation, but it's applies most strongly and particularly to Israel. And then many other places in the Old Testament, we have the same principle that the more closely a nation follows God, the more blessed it will be. But when we come to the New Testament, we find Christianity very personalized because that really is where having a right relationship with God has always resided anyway, in the believer's heart. And so it's interesting that all of John's epistles and his gospel are also very personal in the way that they're written. I think we all know that the Gospel of John gives a lot of personal stories of John's relationship with Jesus Christ, and he's considered the one to have had the maybe the closest relationship according to what the Bible says. But let's just look at some verses in the book of John, also 1 John, just to tie things together, that John says about salvation and how we can know we have it. and. So going back to the book of John, we won't turn here either for sake of time. We have John 3.18. John 3.18 says, He that believeth on him, Christ is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So John, in his very first book in the New Testament, makes it really clear that being a Christian is all about having a relationship with Christ. And then if we move to 1 John, we won't turn there either, but 1 John 2, chapter 2, verses 3 through 11, well, maybe we will turn there. Um, these verses talk about the same kind of thing. So let's read this longer passage in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 11, and we can see the personal nature of these verses. John addresses believers as my little children, very tender and very personal. And that really sets the stage for the kind of thing that he's talking about what Christianity is. It's not a state religion. It's not part of being in a Christian nation, as good as that would be. But it's a very personal thing. And so starting with chapter two in 1 John, verse three, hereby do we know that we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. So we can see right away the resemblance there between verses 5 and 6 of 2 John. Then he continues, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith, he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. It's an interesting thing here to go into a word study of exactly the wording in this verse 7 because in the Greek, the words that he's using for new and old are words that signify a continuity with the old covenant. We're not under the Old Covenant anymore, but there were some things from the Old Covenant that lasted. And 
every one of those continuities between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, the New Testament re makes really clear. And so John's really saying this is not a brand new thing. This is something that was taught in the Old Testament. This is something that was true in the Old Covenant. This is something that believers were taught before even Christ was born into the world. And so he says, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment, which you had from the beginning. And then going down to verse 8, again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now cometh. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is no occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whether he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. One of my favorite childhood memories is memorizing these verses with an organization called the Bible Memory Association. They don't exist as such anymore, but they have kind of an offshoot, and the original founders' children are still involved in that organization. And so I have fond memories of memorizing these during the summer times and school times, and they're really good verses because they lay out how personal Christianity really is. And then let's look at First John chapter 5, verse 1, and we'll see that continuity again, that John is just really pressing this same thread. He says in First John chapter 5, verse 1, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. So we see that John's linking several threads here. He's linking belief in Christ as God with belief in Christ as Redeemer with our heartfelt love, which we won't discuss at this point, but which the Bible very much teaches that only the Holy Spirit can give. And then this is connected with obedience to God's commandments, which is the same thing that was commanded in the Old Covenant and the Old Testament. So these are the four elements. We love, we believe in Christ, we believe in him as God, sent from God the Father. We have love in our hearts toward him and others, and we obey what he has told us to do. And then we've already seen that Second John and Third John really follow up these same threads as well. Let's look at Second John again. Go back there. And let's start with verse 7 and go through verse 11. John follows out these same threads in these verses 7 through 11 of 2 John. He says, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is the deceiver and antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. In other words, the person who is a Christian, he accepts God as God the Father, but also Christ as the Son of God, equally divine. Verse 10, if there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. In other words, we're not supposed to give ecclesiastical or evangelical encouragement to those that are not teaching this teaching that John is teaching here, which is what Jesus taught, which is what the Old Testament taught, in a way, years before Christ came into the world in human form. And then verse 11 says, For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. We don't really have time to go into particulars about the fullness of what John is talking about here, but it's very clear that John's not expecting a kind of human perfection. He is expecting that we will follow out the Christian life imperfectly. And we all know without taking time to read it here that John gives provision and instruction about what we do when we fall into sin and when our imperfections come into play. We have 1 John 1, 9, for example, um, that we all know that we won't turn to at this point that talks about how we can confess our sins. And then John says other things that round out the picture. So we're not some kind of miraculous Christian saints here. 
for human Christian saints who are stumbling and falling at times and sinning at times, but the big difference between us and those who don't know the Lord is in verse 9. A person who doesn't know the Lord as Savior can transgress, can sin, can do what God has said not to do or refuse to do things that God has said to do. I think sometimes we eliminate that part of the picture. And that person still is not in God because being in God or out of God does not depend on the things we do. It depends only on what Christ did. But the second part of verse 9 is all about abiding in the doctrine of Christ. And so if we abide in Christ's doctrine, we've been converted because Christ drew us to himself and we came to him in faith. Then there's the possibility of sin and imperfection, but still that doesn't destroy our being in Christ because Again, being in Christ doesn't depend on what we do or don't do. It's interesting to tie these teachings back to the teachings of Jesus. Let's go back to Matthew 22, where Jesus was teaching in the time that he was on earth. So Matthew chapter 22, he really says the same things that John is saying in the places we've been looking at. So there's a lot of continuity here. We've seen continuity between the New Testament, the Old Testament, and now we're going to see continuity between what Jesus taught and what John taught. So Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 and 40, 37 to 40, starting with verse 37, Jesus is responding to questions that were asked, and he says, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. There's that concept of love again. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments and all the law and the prophets. If we were to do a word study on this into the Greek, there's something rather amazing about these verses too. And also about some of the verses in John First, uh, second John, rather, there is a distinction made in sections like this between the Old Covenant and the, Old, and the New Covenant. In this passage in Matthew, for example, when Jesus is talking about the two commandments, verse 40, hang all the law and prophets, there's a word there that signifies the teachings of Jesus, Jesus who was speaking here and not the law of Moses. So there's a transition being made between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. I think that's very helpful for us to remember because a lot of times people get confused because there's not a clear division between these two, two covenants. Another thing I could have mentioned about conditions 100 years ago was theological concerns. Sometimes I think we think the church 100 years ago was this idyllic place, it was free of controversy, not so. 100 years ago in the Baptist churches, there was a person named William Whiston. William Whiston grew up in this country. He went to Union College in Tennessee near Manchester, but then he went to Germany and studied in Leipzig, which, as we can learn from the history of the church, was a place where liberal theologians taught, really people who didn't believe that Christ was divine. They even doubted his historicity. They certainly didn't believe he could save from sin. And it was the home of the higher critics along with other cities in Germany like Heidelberg and Göttingen. And so William Winston went for college, for graduate school training at this place. He came back into the States and he was teaching at Southern Baptist Seminary, which was then in Greenville, South Carolina. Then they moved to Louisville. But he started teaching that Baptists had not existed until 1641. And he said he had amassed a whole lot of information. He was using a historico-critical method that he learned in Germany. And really, he swayed a lot of people to follow his teaching that Baptists had not existed until 1641. Within a few months after he'd published a paper on this in 1896, in 1897, 
the Presbyterian theologian B.B. Warfield was following this view as well and teaching it to others, and yet other lesser people were adopting this view that Baptists were only recent, that baptism by immersion had started with the Reformation only, and this was a huge controversy, as it should have been. And there were a lot of Baptists who said, no, this can't be right because the New Testament teaches immersion. And so it's wrong to say that immersion was a hidden teaching that came about only in 1641. And my point here is, my point here is, first of all, there's always been controversy in this world. There have always been problems in the world. We've always needed to have what the Bible says. We've always needed to know what the Bible says. There's never been an age where this was not true. There's never been a time when the Bible didn't speak to us needfully because of all of these controversies that come up in a fallen world. But secondly, we as Christians and we as Baptists need to be aware of what the Bible teaches lest we be swayed by the controversies of the day. And so, even though we don't have time to go into that any further, let's just make one observation as we close about John's teaching. Let's look at John 13, verse 34. I really wish we had more time to look at 3 John, but that would take us into like quarter till eight, so we won't. Let's look at John 13, 34, and we won't turn there at this point, but Jesus himself said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. It's interesting here, again, there's a separation made between the two covenants. When John, under Holy Spirit inspiration, wrote what Jesus said in his book, in John 13, 34, he didn't use a Greek word that he could have to signify the law of Moses. Instead, he uses a word that signifies the teachings of Jesus. So again, John's making a point which comes out interestingly on a word study, this is a new covenant. This is a new covenant book. And we could say more about the new covenant versus the, the old, but let's just note here that uh, Jeremiah 31, 31 prophesied hundreds of years in advance that the old covenant wasn't permanent. The Pharisees really should have known this if they'd been studying the Bible. And it actually prophesied there would be, in that section in Jeremiah, a new covenant coming that would be better. And of course, I think we all know the book of Hebrews talks about how the new covenant is better than the old in a lot of certain respects. But one respect in which the new covenant is better is it's just so simple. We can be thankful for the Ten Commandments. We can have gratefulness and respect for the Old Testament law. We should know it. The fact is, a lot of it was very complicated. And under the New Covenant, we have a lot of leeway in certain personal matters that Old Covenant believers did not. And so the book of Hebrews and other places talk about how this is really a better thing. So John makes that very clear demarcation. The simplicity of salvation today involves certain obligations. After we are converted, it's expected a Christian would show that he has an affinity for the church and he has affinity for the Bible and he has an affinity for certain expectations like looking forward for Christ's second coming and trying with God's help and prayer not to sin. But still that's a lot simpler of a life than the old covenant would give believers in this day. And so... John completes these two great big threads, knowing what it is to be a Christian, that we follow Christ, we accept him as God, we accept him as divine, we have love in our hearts which the Holy Spirit can give, and this love including loving, includes loving God and obeying his commandments. As, as we close, I'd like to just take a minute to think about the world in which John lived. It's interesting, the more historians look at ancient times, in the time the New Testament was given, the more it looks like our times. In fact, I think there's a reason for that. God, his omniscience, actually planned the Bible to be given in such a time that would be so similar to ours, the message could hardly be missed. 
In fact, I don't have time to give examples, but it's interesting how many atheists know so many tons of things about the Bible. They know fully what the Bible teaches. And they even understand the significance of those teachings for the time it was given, they were given in and also for today. They just don't want to follow the God who gave the teachings. But be that as it may, the ancient world of 2,000 years ago was a lot more similar to ours than we may think. Sometimes we think, I'm so stressed. Well, and I will agree, life is stressful. Last night I went to bed with three stresses, and I said, God, I don't know what, what to do about any of these three things, and they're just really vexing me. Well, today one of them got kind of resolved, so I'm thankful for that, and the other two are still lingering. But life just has problems. Like Job said, problems are going to come to us just because we live in a fallen world. But the ancient Greco-Roman world in which John lived was not a stress-free world. It was a very stressful world. There was a lot of traveling in that world. People going to and fro, traveling over the roads of Rome that spanned 3,000 miles north and south and east to west. There were stresses that had to do with schedules and appointments. These people were not living some kind of easy life without obligation. Every town had its clock tower. Well, that's still true today pretty much in Europe. Towns have their clock towers. Even older town squares in this country have clock towers. Problem is, you were expected to live by the time. And so the time was in full display of everyone, and so unless you lived out on a farm and just lived by the, the rising sun and the setting sun, you lived by these clocks. And then people had calendars. They would plan things in advance. They had calendars that would predict things years in advance. They had calendars that would predict events decades in advance. They could plan when the next Olympic game would be, for example. And then they even had certain computer devices, not digital computers like Apple computers, but they had computer devices of a real sort that would compute certain things they needed to know by turning a hand crank. I can imagine people back then just saying, I just can't, can't get this new technology. And then the Roman world was always about building things. They built roads, they built aqueducts, they built new cities. Um, all of the people connected with Rome were big, big city builders. Um, Antiochus Epiphanes, the person mentioned in the book of Daniel several hundred years before he actually lived, who would desecrate the temple in 167 BC, um, he built a lot of cities for himself. They were all called Antioch. He built 14 of them. One of those Antiochs is still around, but there are 13 others he built. So the Romans were always big builders. And so if you lived anywhere except out in the distant country, you were near some construction. Living in Rome was probably more like living in Clearwater. You know, when's that construction on Highway 19 ever going to be done? When's all the noise going to be done? And then there was military conflict and terrorism. Rome was in its distant borders under siege constantly. That's why it had to have a standing army. Like there was a big, big nation on the east of Rome called the Parthian Nation. They lasted twice as long as the U.S. has lasted, and they were always trying to infiltrate, Ro to infiltrate Rome and bring it down because Rome was rich. Well, the Parthians were rich too, but of course, they, they went the way of all nations, just like Rome did eventually. But my point is, life then needed the Bible just as much as we needed it, and we needed it no more than people back then needed it. We need it just like they did. And so Jesus gave it to them, and he gave it to us, and we really need to read it. We really need to know what's in it. And so the personalness of Christianity as John presents it in his gospel and in his three letters, a lot of material there, a lot more that could be said. But let's bring this to a close and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we... Let's pray that we would take to heart what your word tells us and that we would, in all of our human frailty, seek to live it in the way that you expect and want us to. And Lord, then when we fall short, may we avail ourselves of the openings that even, even John the Apostle gives us to confess our sins and, and try our best to be right with you. And then Lord, when all is said and done, thinking that we can fall on your mercy, as frail human beings, because we need you, we need you every hour.
We pray that you would bless the rest of our church service. In Jesus' name, amen.